Wait a second. This isn't your grandma's cancer show. Not your grandma's cancer show. Hi, I'm Tatum Duroc, and today we are talking about losing fertility. Whether we were planning children or not, Cancer and its treatment sometimes takes away the choice, the choice of a life we thought we'd have. And processing this loss at the same time as cancer can be so lonely. And that's why I've got three lovely guests on Zoom with me today. I've got Katie, who found a lump on her fifth wedding anniversary. We've got um, Gemma, who she had a number of coping mechanisms that she'd had before she had cancer. And then after she was diagnosed, they didn't work so well. And she was on the hunt for new ones. So we're going to find out what helped with her. And right now I've got Amanda with me, who was 37 when she was diagnosed. And Amanda, can you tell me what was going on in your life at that time? Um, yeah, hi. I um, It was a January and it was on my list of things to do. I'm a bit of a hypochondriac and I was like, I've got this random lump. Surely it's nothing. No one in my family has cancer. Like we have big heart attacks and all that kind of diversion going on. There's like not a single person. And I have lots of other women in my life. Like no one has lumps, no one has cancer. Just was not on my radar. Um, and at the time I was working as a camera assistant. So that's in TV, um, film and drama. Incredibly stressful, difficult job. Very, very physical. So I was very independent. I was self-employed. And I've been doing it now for like 10 years, maybe a bit longer. And I was kind of hitting my stride, thinking what to do next. Do I want to go up to the next level? Do I want to set up on my own? But, you know, very much used to getting up at three in the morning, driving somewhere in the country, doing a 12 hour shift, doing a 16 hour shift, doing all these things. I took a lot of pride in my like sort of strength. It's, it was then pre me too, very sexist industry. You had to kind of be one of the boys, listen to the jokes, carry the heavy stuff. You know, I was kind of, I think I took a lot of my self-esteem from my strength, yeah, my independence, and um, but I had this lump, and I just kept thinking. I kept like crying in the shower, thinking this is just your anxiety. I only felt it when I was anxious, and I kept thinking, should I ask my mum? I don't. Oh, oh. And it was like, no, come on, this is the January list of things to do. Tax return, go to the doctor. <laughs> and, you know, and I went to the doctor, and I'll never know. I had this lovely GP who went, um, but it doesn't feel like anything serious to me but um, I'll put you on the emergency list anyway. And I still want to sort of go back to her and go, what did you really think? And then funny enough, I had a bit of a, a tricky diagnosis because the consultant I went to see sort of, you know, got your boob out, she had a feel and she went, no, nah, it doesn't really feel like cancer. And even at that point, you know, with some sort of knowledge of how these things work, I thought you shouldn't really be telling me this. Mm. And she had this student and he was allowed to touch it. And then as soon as I started having ultrasounds, mammograms, everybody's face just fell, biopsies. And you suddenly, because it's a day clinic, I went to UCH, um, University College Hospital. Because um, at the time as well, I was living in central London. I was like, I love where I live in King's Cross. I, you know, I felt like I was right in the heart of things. And, and I love UCH, it's this amazing hospital. Um, but yes, you really feel like everything's happening at once. And within an hour, you get basically diagnosed with cancer. Wow. The consultant was like, oh God, I, I didn't expect this. And she ran out the room. I mean, if she'd have had a duvet, she'd have looked out the window and climbed down. She was so like, it was so unprofessional, bless her. And she I, just kind of handed me to the breast cancer nurse. How did you feel about that? I mean, that all happening in, in the space of an hour, like, was there a yeah. whiplash from that? Definitely. And I think, well, I mean, as you know, there's a whiplash from the whole experience. Yes. And funny enough, I was listening to one of your previous podcasts and one of the contributors sort of talked about this. If you get a bit misdiagnosed, how it can really affect you. And I remember just being like, oh, yes. And I didn't, I never saw that consultant again for mm. ages. It never really occurred to me. And, and after, I mean, it's a busy London hospital, so you see all different people. And basically that was like the worst thing I encountered. I was very lucky. And the nurses were just amazing. I remember that there was this very small elderly nurse and she could see that I was about to get told I had cancer. And she just took me away and was like, just sit down for 20 minutes. I've got your phone number. I'll come and call you, like gave me a hug. Aww. So everyone else was very careful. And funny enough, after I'd had all my treatment or I was maybe done with chemo, 
um, I, I sort of found another lump. I wasn't too worried and I, I just went back because, you know, just to double check. And I had that consultant again and I'd literally never seen her again. And I had a huge panic attack. Mm. And that's when I was like, oh, I was really affected by that. Yeah. And it stayed, that really stayed with me, actually. And again, she just kind of got my breast and went, well, you've just got a really lumpy breast. And I was like, oh, God, I'm, you know, I'm I... in the same same sort of situation. So I think that, yeah, that does have a knock-on effect long term. It de- you know, it definitely sort of set off my anxiety. Yeah, um, I mean, your life is in their hands, right? So when they're like, yeah. oh, no, and, oh, yes, you know, it it does it jars you you're like oh what what can I trust now going forward I had a real obsession weirdly sorry to that real obsession of trying to find that student again like you know how things fixate when you're really anxious about stuff again you can fixate on certain things and I was like I just want to find him and go that is what a tumor feels (laughs) you know and I can only think that with my breast it was like literally straight under the nipple because they did have a bit of trouble sort of accessing it and so it was almost the shape of my breast but just quite ridgy and lumpy and so maybe she did just think, oh, I was just a bit rigid and lumpy. But anyway, anyway so, um, yeah, I walked away from that. And my poor sister, she worked nearby. And I remember just texting her because she was like, oh, I can come and see you and help. And I was like, oh, I'll call you if I need you. And I just texted her, like, cancer. It's cancer because that's all I could write. And my yeah. poor sister was just like, Ugh. you know, and kind of came and found me. And we both sort of walked away shaking and went and had a gin and tonic in, in a pub next door. I'm so glad that she was so close and you were able to get to that gin so quickly. <laughs> yeah, what, we both just kind of sat there like, Whoa, wow. At what point did someone mention to you that there was a risk to your fertility? Do you know, that's an interesting question. I remember the fertility stuff happening, but I don't remember when it was first mentioned to me. And I think that's part of the thing. It slightly caught me off guard. I think the big headline when you're quite young was that I had to have a mastectomy, not a lumpectomy. Um, and I guess there's such a sort of feeling like that's so devastating for a woman that I got a lot of help around that. And then when the IVF was offered, you're kind of transferred to another part of the hospital all of a sudden. And, you know, you're suddenly learning that you're going to have to become really good at navigating NHS hospitals. Yeah. And um, they did mention taking Zolodex, which in the end I don't think I got, which would have slowed down everything while I was having the chemo. Um, and then... They did. So then I kind of got shunted down to the uh, fertility part and I had this again. They were really lovely, but they really scared you. I I think it was a deliberate tactic. So I had estrogen positive cancer. So, you know, shoving me full of estrogen was scary, Um, but they made it sound absolutely horrific. Like I was going to have all these jabs, then all these counter jabs. I, you know, I was probably getting really sick. It might kill me. And I was so overwhelmed by the whole process. And I felt like I was in this kind of vice grip, like I'd been given basically two days to say yes or no to this treatment. And where Um, were you in terms of wanting to have children at that point? So at that point in my life, I'd been in a very casual, well, casual-ish relationship for probably far too long (laughs) that I should, because it was just very convenient. And But it wasn't a relationship really to be having children in. Um, And I was 37 and I was thinking to myself, this probably isn't going to happen. I, I think living in London, my, I had a very close group of friends. Most of them, if they were going to get married, would get married around 30. Interestingly, their husbands were always 40. That was obviously the age of a man in London ready to commit, 10 years older than the women. And they were just starting to have kids. And I'd quite enjoy, because I worked freelance, I quite often was like either away or, you know, I'd been there when my friends, like my best friend had the baby and I was there the same day, like holding it. And so I'd had a lot of input, which was nice. And I really enjoyed being, again, that very energetic, lively auntie, And I really enjoyed being able to give my friends loads of support, you know, bringing up your friend, like, you know, they talk about it takes a village to raise Mm -hmm. a child. And I think I just thought that gently I probably wouldn't. Um, I'd grown up with polycystic ovary syndrome. So there'd always been this thought of like, if you wanted to get pregnant, we probably would have had to help you anyway. So I'd always known it would have been a bit of an issue, maybe. And like I said, I was in this relationship. I couldn't see any other one on the horizon, but I think... You know, I didn't rule it out and I was kind of hoping, I guess, it would be a gentle slide to childlessness. (laughs) And that, you know, being childless maybe could be quite, would be fine. I had all my friends. I was very active and I could take an active part in their lives. And I think to sort of suddenly be confronted with all of those feelings in two days. Yeah. And they really kept saying, you've got to hurry, you've got to make a decision. You know, the longer you leave it, the chemo. And I just, 
I'd gone back to my mum's to have the mistake, you know, to be to be with her. And I just kept weeping and weeping and weeping. And I couldn't, I could not make this decision. And my lovely friends would sit with me and talk it through. And I think um, I knew that I wasn't going to have kids. And I knew that I shouldn't take the money off the NHS. But I just at that point couldn't, couldn't draw that line. But then on the other hand, you had all the doctors telling you it was going to be horrifically dangerous for you. And interestingly, I was a little bit annoyed, actually. I could see why they did it. But as soon as I said yes, loads of support mechanisms were put in place. And the nurse, it was almost as if the nurses took like a deep, relaxing breath and were like, oh, don't worry, it's not as bad as we said. And I felt like I could have really done with that support before. I mean, that, that decision tore me apart. It was horrendous. And I think it slightly caught me off guard. Because yeah. I hadn't been like crazy child focused. But yes, so I can only think it was that knowledge in my brain that this, that this was it. And I was slightly annoyed with myself for not just being brave enough to say, I'm not going to do the IVF. Let's just get on with chemo. So in the end, you ended up doing the IVF. Yeah. And when you got to the end of treatment, did you then need to revisit kind of where you were at with things? Yeah, I think, well, I think sadly my IVF also wasn't very successful. And I had a bit of a bad time with that because I started off with the NHS and there was long queues and everything, but I always got to see really good people, brilliant nurses, brilliant consultants. And then it just so happened it was over the Easter Bank holiday. And with this IVF, you know, it was so critical. I was getting my blood taken every day. And so I had to be transferred to a private clinic. And that was a totally different ball game. And I, I'm so anti-private medicine because of this, but it, it's so hard to explain to people what the difference is. I got the hot chocolates, I got the magazines, there were no cues, but I didn't see a single consultant. I just had nurses, they didn't talk to me and no one told me anymore what was happening. And so basically I, they took three and a half eggs and I had no idea that wasn't really working, that not much was happening. And they wanted to put a positive spin on it. So I've got these lovely smiley nurses going, that's three and a half eggs. And then when I Googled it, I was like, that's terrible. That's nothing. And you know, they weren't being made into embryos, you know, because I wasn't in a relationship. And I slightly had to deal with that shock on my own, mm. you know, being like, oh, after all that, actually, again, it just felt like another thing that made it increasingly unlikely. And so I had kind of reconciled myself to that. And I, I really struggled with chemo. Like my body just was constantly neutropenic. I was in and out of a &E. It wasn't fun. <laughs> and um, I think by the time I came out, yeah, you know, I felt like such a shell of myself. Um, and I, you know, I now suffer from anxiety and um, I really struggle. And I just, you know, it's so far from my ability to be a parent in any way, um, which is something to come to terms with. But it just, you know, I look at my friends and how tired they are. And I'm like, I'm tired. I don't have any children. <laughs> I Well, you know, you raise a really um, interesting point there because sometimes, you know, there is this sort of ideal of what a, you know, and you can call it many different ways, but a child free um i know there's a few different terms for it life might look like did you feel like you were you were able to do that no so i think like i was saying before when i was 37 and healthy um well, there's a good bit i don't know if any of you've watched sex in the city but it was my like go-to piece of uselessness when my brain was all over the place and there's a bit where one of the main characters is talking to another character about how would you deal with child? She's thinking about it. How would you deal with childlessness? And she's like, well, what would that look like? You know, foreign travel, partying with friends, lovely mm -hmm. clothes. And, you know, that's not so bad. And uh, I think now I was like, oh, what does it look like? Isol so I would, yeah, I couldn't see either a fun independent alternative either post cancer. So whereas if I'd stayed well, I'd have had contact with kids, but equally I could have been like, do you know what? Your kids are annoying. I'm going to a bar. I'm going to go dating. I'm going to go traveling. Um, my work is really interesting. You know, it used to take me all over the world, all over the country. I met lots of famous people. It was very stressful, but it was very interesting. Um, and all of that had gone. And you're just left going, well, I'm living at home with my mom. Um, and I find, you know, I don't have enough energy to see friends, maybe one friend a day, and then maybe a day off. Uh, all those things that I like to do, I'm now quite frightened of. Traveling on my own, driving on my own. I used to love driving. I used to love long drives. And now I was like, I think I'm just going to fall asleep at the wheel, you know, and, and all that kind of fun side of it had, had gone. So you're not one thing or the other anymore. So that's a huge amount of loss. And to have those decisions made so quickly, you yeah. know, it, it, in kind of this compacted time, 
you know, you can really see kind of, you know, really illustrated that turmoil of that time. And I could see Katie nodding at several points while you were talking, Amanda. Um, Katie, were, were there parts in Amanda's story that you could relate to? Oh, so much of it. Um, just from the very start, Amanda, I mean, your career, my I met my husband through a friend who is a camera operator, a female camera operator um, for a big TV show. So all the things you were saying, I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, I've heard all that before, I've seen all that before, I understand that lifestyle. Um, you know, but I think for me, particularly that point where you're a consultant, so I had a very similar sort of experience where um, we'd gone in, I had was on the two week referral, gone in, had the mammogram, walked into the doctor's room and she didn't even speak to me. She just put her hands all over my breast and my, and my neck. And and, um, and then she sat down, she was doing stuff on the computer and she was just like, I'm really worried about this. I'm really worried about this. And um, I walked out of her room and sat in the waiting room waiting to go back in and have a biopsy and, and then obviously um, everything beyond that. And I sat in, in the 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 area where all the women are gowned up and obviously everybody else is older than me and and I just started crying and I went well don't see her so she's a bloody nightmare you know so they were like oh don't worry I've been in before it could just be a cyst it could be that and I'm like that's not what she said you know um and then I was taken into a biopsy room um where the nurses were talking over my head um, and they were saying about putting a clip in, um, you know, because it might be cancer. So at this point, nobody has spoken to me other than this sort of like manic sort of touching of my breast. And um, But yeah, I then went in, this is sort of really condensed version. There's lots and lots of my experience of diagnosis I want to expand upon, but I think what I'm trying to get at is the the reference to Amanda's story was that whole thing around sort of sitting back in that room with that consultant. Um, and we've been in a position, so just to sort of explain my backstory really, um, my mother-in-law had only passed away from breast cancer six weeks prior to my diagnosis. My husband was in the room with me and they were using all this language. It was like, here's your, here's a Macmillan nurse. And I'm sat there going, I know what a Macmillan nurse is. I'm not going to respond until you say the words cancer. Because at this point, nobody's had the decency to be that clear. And then um, they were sort of talking about all this different, I don't know, we were concerned about it or this or that. Everything bought the word cancer. And eventually they went, you know it's cancer, don't you? And with that, my husband slumped in the seat next to me. He looked like somebody had literally taken a baseball bat to him and he literally just slumped in the seat. And I turned to him and I was like, I am so sorry, I am so sorry. And the nurse is saying to me, why are you apologizing? And I said, because we only buried his mum to the same disease six weeks ago. At which point the consultant who was yet to speak to me, or I couldn't even tell you her name, stood up and left the room because she couldn't cope. What? And I think in terms of what Amanda's saying, that sort of, I didn't see her again. I only saw her probably when I went for an annual mammogram or something like that, you know, that sort of back in that environment. But yeah oh that's um, just one thing after another of just failure to communicate clearly and and then to say you know it's cancer like yeah. you know like you're the clinician in the room like what's like that's you know even if you're unsure if someone knows or not you would ask a question like can you tell me you know what what you're thinking at this moment like can what knowledge do you have at this time you know you yeah. try and find that out instead of you know it's cancer which is again like a way that your husband also maybe didn't need to hear that news um 
it, it's a just a very confusing situation. Did something similar happen when it came to someone telling you about your fertility status? Was that? Oh, it, was in, it was in the same meeting. It was in the same meeting. In the same meeting. And what did they say? Um, so I got asked two questions. Um, just again, go reference an Amanda sort of experience. So I was a double H bust. Um, and although my tumor was the size of a plum, um, it, they were going to treat me um, with chemotherapy first. Um, so it meant I could have a lumpectomy instead of the, the breast off because it would have been too big surgically for the size of my bust. And, and it was the conversation was, um, what bra size was I? And I said, um, I'm a 36 double H or something, whatever, whatever it was. And I, I hate my breasts um, because I'm tall and big busted, wearing clothes, is, finding clothes that fit and really difficult. And um, I don't like them. I, I love a breast reduction. They're very, very heavy and they cause me a lot of problems. So I turned around and I said, well, do me a favor though. If you're getting rid of that one, get rid of that one because I, you know they're too much, you know, um, don't think in a million years you're going to build that one up to be the same size as the other. Um, but we did get into a discussion quite inter interestingly in the room around that because my friend um, who'd been diagnosed, I know a lot of women who had breast cancer before me, and um, one of my friends from school had actually been diagnosed with a secondaries um, just before I was diagnosed with my primary. So again, slightly different from Amanda's story. I knew a lot of women with breast cancer. Um, but I was I was talking about my friend and I was like, but my friend was, was a, like, say for argument's sake, like a C cup and her um, tumor was the size of a pea and they gave her a mastectomy. And that's when they explained it was the amount of breast tissue that I had. I had a lot of breast tissue to play with, which meant I could have a lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy. Um, so that was one sort of discussion, um, very, very rapid, as you can imagine. And then the second one was, um, did we have children? Were we thinking about having children? So there were a couple of things in our lives, which were, we'd met when we were older. We were, Amanda, like you were saying, we were 37. Um, I was 35 when I met her, I was 37 when we got married. Um, so we had this viewpoint that, um, we don't. We'd not long lived in our house for four years. We had a mortgage. We, you know, we'd gone out and partied as young people. So, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't we didn't, have, didn't have much finances behind us. Um, you know, and then there'd been a number of issues. But both of us looked at it from a perspective that neither of us had had children before we'd entered our relationship. You know, we we'd not had that life type of lifestyle or chosen to go down that route prior to that. Um, so when we were sort of asked the question about, do you have children, do you want children, do you want to harvest your eggs? Um, probably as quickly as that I was asked. Um, we just looked at each other and because we just had the experience of, of, of um, obviously burying my, my mother-in-law, um, we just looked at each other and my husband said to the nurse, will it delay treatment? And she said, yes. And we both went, well, no, then let's, as Amanda says, let's crack on and, and, and get the treatment done. Um, because that was what was most prevalent in our minds. Um, there'd been a delay in my diagnosis um, through the GP. I had been going to the GP and complaining of um, breathlessness and itchy red palms, which I now know is an indicator of raised estrogen and um, is a, an indicator towards breast cancer. But because it was double H bust, there was no lump for me to feel. So obviously it had to be a significant size for me to feel that in the back, for me to even go to the GP, for me to even say, here's a lump. So I hadn't, I, I, I yeah, hadn't been referred early enough. Um, so there were lots and lots of things going on. So after, you made that decision. So again, kind of the, the echoes that I can hear of Amanda's story is the speed. So you're in there and you're like, ah, where am I in my life right now? Um, I'm gonna make a decision. Um, did did that change for you? Did did you stick with that decision? Did you? 
well, decide again, to do bit, something it else? It was strange. So I, I, um, I went. We went back to my parents' house. So my my parents obviously knew I'd gone for the mammogram, and they were waiting at home for us to to go back and tell them what had happened in the appointment. And um, we went round, and I sort of um, my dad refused to believe it. He's like, "It's not. It's not. It's a cyst. I'm, I'm not having it. It's a cyst." Um, and then I was like, "Well, we decided to not." you know, go around, go down that route. We're, we're going to go straight for treatment and um, this, that, and the other. Um, I found my brother. Um, I was making a joke out of it on the phone and I was like, well, that's it, mate. I always told you I wasn't going to have kids. Well, that's, that's the facts now. Yeah, let's face it. Um, and a couple of weeks later, my parents actually came in to um, see the surgeon um, with us. And my mum said to the nurse, I think Katie made a rash decision in choosing not to have her eggs harvest. And um, now that was my decision, and it was my decision at that point in time. But I wasn't privy to even that conversation. I was just sat in the room as, as my mum and my nurse were, were talking about it. And my nurse's response to my mother was... Um, well, it's an estrogen, we now know it's an estrogen driven cancer, and therefore we wouldn't want to pump her with estrogen in order to harvest her eggs. Um, they probably won't, because of her age, they probably won't um, put her through a IVF um, after treatment. But let's face it, who'd want a baby at 47 anyway? And how how did you feel in that moment? I think that was the thing that sent me spiraling. So you weren't forty seven at that point, right? No. That the reason that she said that age was because it would have been five years. Post. Five years past. So you were forty two. Yeah. And you know, people are having children at forty two, forty three, forty four. Yeah. Um. But because the nurse added. The extra five years. Yeah. yeah, that's really, really tough way to hear that, to have your yeah. options put out in front of you. And and also, you know, those guidelines of five years can change, right? Like they're usually a case by case basis. That's not a hard and fast rule. Um, and it didn't sound like that was a specialist nurse to be dishing out that information. Yeah, I think for me, I've we ended up sort of a few years later because it was obviously the one thing that sort of played on my mind really heavily. And there were lots of things. There were lots of nurses who said lots of inappropriate things throughout um, throughout my treatment. Sort of, I think in between even. Um, you know, the stages you go through where you have to go through all the scans to make sure it hasn't spread anywhere. And um, there was another nurse within that department that asked me if I had children and I said no, who told me that it was okay because I could always adopt. Right, because it's um, really up to other people to tell. <laughs> you know, did you, t you know, like, who do we tell? Who do we walk up to and go, you can adopt? Technically, anyone can adopt. And yet, when someone's in that situation, that kind of entitled, you can adopt, it really can miss the mark. How did it make you feel? I think there's sort of so many things. So I worked in children's services. So I actually worked in a service with young people leaving care. Um, and my understanding from working in the sector was that obviously it would greatly reduce my chances of doing it. But because I worked in the sector, one of the things I did when I was diagnosed is I came home and I rang social services and I went, will it blow me out? I want to check. Although I work in the sector, I don't work in fostering or adoption and I want to know what my what my chances are. But actually since then, since we've gone down the route of going to the fertility clinic and going through fostering and adoption routes, um, it's really interesting actually when you go to adoption, even though my oncologist has told me for years he will support me in an application, as will my GP, um, we haven't even got past the initial sort of phone call, yeah. 
you know, hi, my name is, and can I tell you that I've had cancer? Mm -hmm. And then they just go, okay, lovely, thanks very much for your phone call. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's one thing on paper where social services can say that it won't rule you out, but actually in reality, um, you know, you can, you can be fighting a losing battle with an individual. And I think that's true of our health professionals when we're looking at those two nurses who are quite happy to want to make things better and reassure you or do things in a way that is their personal opinion in a crisis moment. And I mm -hmm. think it boils down to them feeling, how do we cope? How do we cope with this situation? It was the same for the doctor and those two nurses, how do we cope in this uncomfortable situation? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely people flounder and say really bizarre things. I was once told, did I consider getting a monkey? Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I mean, have you been watching too much early Friends with like Ross and his monkey? Like, what? What? Like, it just almost made my head explode. Um, yeah, the things that people say, and I think that, you know, there may be an intention, you know, they think, oh, well, you can always adopt. I know for myself, there was a very big difference between me wanting to have my own child and me wanting to adopt. In my personal experience, not putting anything on anybody else, but I felt they were two different things. They are. And there's the, you can have a grief for one and still do the other. Lots of people do very successfully. But when it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of the same, it doesn't, you know, to me, it didn't feel the same. Gemma, I'd love to bring you in here. How's it been listening to Amanda and Katie? Sorry, I can't stop thinking about how they said, have you thought about having a monkey? Mm. <laughs> yeah. On that one, but yeah, like really, like hard to hear your stories ladies and you know something I noticed was I think with breast cancer um just give you some personal background about myself I've had like two separate primaries I've had a, a cancer in my womb and a cancer in my ovary um so I never had like this incredibly difficult decision that you were both faced with in a very short space of time where they've said you've got to decide, do you want to do this IVF or not? Because for me, they there was a slight chance I could have had IVF, but it would have upstaged my cancer. So in a way, I think that actually made it a little bit easier for me, if anything, because I didn't have that either I do this or I do that, such a life-changing decision at such a, a time where my head was in, you know, sort of all over the shop. Um, I really don't know how I would have coped with that. So in my case it was quite an easy one they were like yes it could cause the cancer to go up a stage i was like right well absolutely not i can't be doing that and they didn't really push the matter at all because it wouldn't have been very wise for me to have ivf with ovarian cancer and womb cancer it, it could have been like a complete disaster but i think that door was closed for me and it was very final and some people think that that's harder but for me personally I think it's a little bit easier because that shred of hope has been removed I'm not chasing it it's like okay that door's closed and it's a shame and I am upset about it and I am disappointed and it's okay to be disappointed but at least it's not you know wondering or sort of putting my life on hold thinking oh there's a slight chance that you know this egg this egg I could be fertile or I could keep this over it. You know, there was just none of that. It was like, okay, like I'm not having biological children. My body's never going to carry children. Um, but yeah, sorry, just going back to your question. Um, what exactly was your question again? Sorry, menopause brain. <laughs> I <laughs> so I relate. I already. I was like, I'm definitely going to digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so relate to menopause brain. Um, th thank you for sharing that. So yeah, having two gynecological cancers and having that choice taken away where had you been before did did you think that you would have kids yeah so um I was 100% planning on having kids um I wasn't in a huge rush for it I have to be honest and one of the many things I sort of think about or I go over in my head is should I have had children earlier would things have been different 
um, should I have spent, you know, my whole life taking birth control just so I could go on holidays and party and be irresponsible and, you know, where I could have been having children. Um, it, I have a good career, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything like, woo, like a huge career, you know, I'm not like a politician or an actress. Do you know what I mean? I'm not Angelina Jolie. So I was like, should I, um, should I have done something differently? Um, but yeah, like similar to what you ladies described, like my diagnosis um, took a very, very long time. Um, I was in and out of the hospital having very invasive procedures for over two years. Um, and they just kept sending me back and sending me back to the GP and signing me out of care and saying, you know, nothing's wrong. Uh, they knew I had a polyp in my womb for two years. Um, even by the time they realized I had womb cancer, um, they were still sort of saying to me, oh, do you want to go on the coil? We can salvage your fertility. Um, and yeah, like I say, when I finally went to get my eggs, cause I was planning on getting my eggs frozen funnily enough, that's when I actually got diagnosed with um, ovarian cancer. I thought, oh yeah, great. I'll freeze my eggs if I have that option. You know, they were saying my womb cancer was very treatable. Um, it was early stage. I was like, great, I'll have a hysterectomy, freeze my eggs. Um, I got to Manchester St. Mary's and she she basically looked at my eggs. I was incredibly fertile. There was nothing wrong with me um, in that regard anyway. Like I had like 15 follicles, I think. But she went into like one ovary and she said, oh, I can't take eggs out of this. I think you've got another cancer or I think your cancer's spread out the womb. And I think at that point I was like, okay, like the conversation's changed. Um, it's a lot more serious than I thought. Um, just take everything out. Um, and they were like, well, we can do the egg freezing. I was like, no, no. Me and my husband sat in the car and I said, because I sort of wanted to give him some time to voice what he would want. And he would have absolutely loved children. Um, but straight away he was like, no, your health becomes sort of comes before your fertility, Gemma. Like, we're not risking your life for it, sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, I, I always planned on having children. Um, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't really disappointed. Um, and like you, Amanda, I have all these thoughts like, oh, well, you know, me and my husband can spend £5,000 on a trip to Vegas now and we can travel we can have all these wonderful drinks and go out with friends and I can have this really rich quality of life still um and I can be kind of optimistic and positive about that but then there's also part of me that's like oh I'm so kind of sad about this like especially when I see my sister and my niece and nephew I'm like all those little potential persons all those potential little gemmas are just lying in a bio bank somewhere like frozen so yeah disappointment is certainly the word but you had shared with me that you had sort of returned to some previous coping mechanisms and what you realized is in this sadness they weren't working for you anymore can you share a little bit about that yeah so i mean when i first got diagnosed like i went a little bit off the rails um as you do basically um i've always been somebody who's quite enjoyed like i've always worked but very hard but i've always party quite hard as well um i've always loved to shop um i've loved always loved to sort of go out and socialize and i think what i did was when i first got diagnosed i just had no idea I didn't have any healthy coping strategies. I wasn't somebody that meditated. I wasn't somebody that really exercised very much. <laughs> like I exercised a bit, but like nothing, nothing proper really, like nothing sufficient. Um, I was one of those people that did all the hours in the office, all the overtime, and then went wild at the weekend and blew all my money. <laughs> um, and I basically was just doing a lot of things that were kind of that kind of worked for me when nothing was wrong, you know. So if I had a stressful day at work, you know, a pint down the pub with some colleagues was really helpful. You know, if me and my husband were having like a bit of a rough time, I don't know, like going to the casino and having a bit of a flutter was helpful. You know, if I was feeling a bit down about myself or having a bit of a down day, going shopping for some makeup or an outfit 
made me feel kind of good and I was like yeah I'm gonna feel so much better when I'm wearing this outfit um and I sort of started doing that to the excess um to the point where I just ended up with loads of credit card debt um I was winning quite a lot of money at the casino but it, I wasn't enjoying it at all like I wasn't excited by it it just felt so empty um and I was going out for drinks and like I wouldn't say I was drinking too much but I wasn't it because I was so emotionally destabilized um I was just waking up feeling a million times more awful than I would had everything been going swimmingly you know like my anxiety was just sky high um so yeah I was basically just using strategies that it worked for me before cancer after cancer and I soon realized that that wasn't getting me anywhere I was just getting myself into like deeper deeper problems um and that's where I basically act, sort of access all the help I could get I did like the shine breakout program I got counseling I went to CBT I just took anything I could um and slowly I started sort of swapping these kind of excessive hedonistic habits for things that were a lot more healthy um all the stuff that I'd sort of frowned upon not frowned upon but not bothered on bothered with before you know like the meditation the prayer the prayer apps the just anything I could do that was kind of a healthier way of coping with my grief and my disappointment and my anxiety I was I was doing um and yeah slowly I started to get quite a lot better I'm not going to say that like I'm 100% you know like I'm not a Buddhist monk or anything like that. Like I'm not, <laughs> like I've still got certain things that I do that probably aren't very sensible, but I'd say I'm certainly in a better space emotionally. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, grief and grief is messy and it, you know, we're often presented with that linear model of, you know, seven stages, you know, but actually, yeah, it is a cluster. And, you know, what you were saying about even winning at the casino and feeling nothing, feeling empty, that numbness, that dissociation, you know, is is as much a part of grief as anger or tears or you know all those other ones that are sort of more recognizable and I think I think one of the things that's really tough is that when there's cancer as well people around are can kind of acknowledge the cancer but not necessarily always hold space for that loss of the children that you wanted to have to them, sometimes that's an invisible grief, but for you, that can feel, and I could hear it when you were talking, Gemma, about the little Gemmas, like that's, it's a very tangible yeah. loss to you. Um, I'd like to put it out to all of you. Did you feel understood by those closest to you? So I'm um, going to Katie and then Amanda and then back to you, Gemma. Um. I don't think I've ever felt fully understood by anybody close around me. And I think that's because of masking that we do. So um, I mentioned before my brother and they have three children. And, you know, I always, um, when I was with them when I was younger, I was always like, I'd be lovely to be in that position, but I was never in a relationship, you know, um, Again, that goes back to something Amanda was saying before, you know, um, we can have relationships, but it doesn't necessarily mean, and, and, you know, it's just one of those. And I think that I was always someone that's like, well, I won't have kids, it's fine, I won't have kids, you know, and, you know, find reasons not to have children and sort of um, do that. So maybe that's not necessarily other people not understanding me, that's the mask I wore and maybe not understanding myself to be mature enough to have worked out how I could put myself in a better place in order to have actually become a mother when I was younger um you know so I think there's that um my family are also going through their own grief for that so I think certainly my mother has mentioned sort of 
in recent years that she would have loved me and my husband to have been parents. Um, you know, so um, the fact that we hadn't got round to that or we'd made decisions not to do that in the five years prior to my diagnosis, um, again, we, you know, it's one of those things. But I think for me, the real, real strength that my husband and I have is that we talk about cancer every day. You know, um, we have a strong relationship. And even if we don't get each other, or sometimes I was saying to you, to take them on the phone about, you know, when we went through all this thing about fostering and adoption and everything, and about the rejection and about the grief that we continually went through. You know, we were, we were continually on this cycle of it because you'd build yourself up to open yourself up to somebody again. And then to be knocked back again, it just got too much for him. And he just got to the stage where he said, I can't do this anymore. We've got to stop. Mm. Um, so I have to respect that. I have to respect him and his feelings in amongst everything else. So I don't think it's just about whether or not I felt understood about by other people. It's about how other people process their grief yeah. and about how I understand myself. Yeah. And there's there's something about you know i can hear in in your husband almost calling it like this is this is the end of the the thing and and you know there there can be pain in extending the possibility um and i know for myself i um had one chance to be pregnant um and I also had an estrogen positive cancer, so it was, you know, quite risky. And I lost the pregnancy, but I had six embryos and I paid every year hundreds and hundreds of pounds for them to stay in storage. And knowing that I couldn't, I couldn't use them again, you know, and, and still not being able to let that go and it there was something about marking that ending that for me was quite a a line in the sand and this big like Gemma I'd really planned to have children um so it was like this you know this end of this sort of dream alternate life that I thought was maybe in a parallel universe like maybe if I went behind a door on the other side I'd be a mum sitting in a PTA meeting or beside a football pitch or what mum would I have been you know would I have been a, a great party host mum you know like would I have thrown or would I have gone oh no sod these gift bags <laughs> like who would I have been and, and one day will I turn a corner and will I see her will I meet her you know, and I decided to unfreeze them and bury them. And as tough as that was, there was something about an end that was marked because I think it is often this invisible, there's often not, you know, uh, a headstone. There isn't a place to you know, where the ashes are. There's, there aren't these formal ritualistic, you know, conventions that we can follow that we do in all these other forms of grief where people come together and they talk about the person that they've lost. And it's both the, the person that you expected to hold in this world and look after and who you were going to be doing it. So it's like such a combination effect. Um, and Amanda, did did you feel understood? Did you feel like you could talk to people? It, it's tricky. I think um, I have a, a mum and a sister, and my dad died very suddenly when I was 23, and that was an enormous trauma for us all. He just dropped dead. And uh, we've always been very tight-knit. And my mum, it was very intense, me being the next really bad news. And funny enough, just before... I got ill. We had this really nice Christmas, 2016. 
And my mum had said something to my sister about, you know, if Amanda ever got ill, I would never cope. I, I, it's like, her, you know, I'm the youngest. And, uh, you know, you're sort of treated with kid gloves, really. Um, and I remember my sister always being like, talk to me, talk to me. Don't talk to mum. Don't talk to mum. I'm fine. I can deal with it. And then she got really ill with shingles. And I was like, we are really, it's really, really intense. The hardest thing I had to do was ring my mum. When I told her, she just left, just went silent. And I luckily, I rang my, we have very close neighbours we've grown up with. So I rang my neighbours first and was like, come and hold mum because she'll, you know. And she's kept it all inside so much. And she's been so wonderful about never saying that she wanted grandchildren. Because my sister's always been adamant that she doesn't want children. Um, she has a much older stepchild because she married somebody much older than her. But for her, it was very black and white. She thinks the world's a terrible place. I do not want to bring children into it. And it's funny because then that, sometimes she sort of co-ops me into that point of view. And I'm like, that's that's not my point of view. I possibly would have liked to have really had children. And so I don't know anyone who, a lot of my friends don't have children, but not because they had cancer. Right. Dealing with the isolation of cancer and the isolation of infertility. Yeah. And I'm very, some of my friends who are childless are just so caring for me. I've got one amazing friend. I went to a party once and I absolutely collapsed. I just had no energy. And she was so perceptive and kind. She got all my stuff together, realized what was happening to me. You know, I have friends like that. And she rescued me, put me in an Uber, took me home. And they give me their time, but we don't talk about not having kids. And I have other friends who've had kids through artificial insemination. So they are single parents, women on their own, but they had that choice. So that's been quite hard. And then some who have been amazingly generous and, you know, allowed me into their family lives, allowed me to have very close relationships with their children, which has been kind of a replacement for me. But I don't know anybody who's in that situation. And so like when COVID hit, you know, all these things that had held me together, my amazing friends, my god kids who are like my own kids, you know, I love them with all my heart. They call me Auntie Amanda. I can pick them up at the school gate. It just went. And that didn't happen for any of my other friends. So definitely my friends who were on their own, um, but they were still working. I got the text saying I had to stay indoors. I lost my job because my job was a receptionist job because I was just trying to get back on my feet with my exhaustion and stuff. I had this nice three-day-a-week receptionist job. Nobody needs receptionists anymore. <laughs> they were like, we don't want to touch you. Don't give us coffees. We don't want any of that. And so suddenly I was at home and totally on my own, no work, no friends, none of the kids that I sort of filled my life with to try and, you know, keep in contact with that side of life. And you're looking online at everyone who's juggling things. And I could see that some of my friends are having a horrific time. You know, the ones who were on their own or the ones who both parents were working. It was an absolute nightmare. But I was just sat in this huge void and no one else was going through that. And actually, funny enough, that's um, when I went on Facebook and joined some Facebook groups. I mean, I was already a part of Shine, but I never checked my phone that often. And now I'm, I've am i really found support through cancer groups because it was that's where people, I was like, is anyone else completely alone at home? Yeah. And all those things that have been compromised anyway because I didn't have the like immune system to be around a lot of kids. But I could be auntie and I could come and help. And I was like, you guys go out for dinner. I'm very happy to look after these kids. I love them. I couldn't do any of that. And so, yeah, and then on the other hand, like I said, I was living with my mom, it's very intense. And if she sees me cry, it hurts her. It physically hurts her and she's so good and she doesn't say that she's upset. And I think she's not too fussed about grandkids. And I'm, I, I try really hard to bring my good kids around as much as possible because they love my mom. She's so quiet, like she's got this shed in our garden and my um, godson loves it and he plays in it all the time. So she made a little wooden sign and it says his, his shed. Aww. And he loves it and he brings it up all the time. He does little pictures for her. But so I try and get her to have some of that. But it's, it's very hard, isn't it? If you just want to have a good old sob and your mum, just to get it out, you might be feeling okay, yeah. but you know what? You just need a good sob to know that you're sort of being watched by your mum, who's not going to be a grandma. Yeah. Um, it, and, you know, and I'm not going to ring up my sister necessarily. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot to take on. It, it can be and, so much to hold. And often yeah. we do hold it alone to you know, I, and I think grief by its nature is lonely. Like I do think there is an essential part of that, but I think it's an extra layer of isolation on top of that. Um, I know for me where it often comes out is watching TV shows and there's um, the, the ones where they're scanning. Yeah. Um, yeah, for the ultrasound. Yeah, I can lose it really quickly in front of almost anyone. That's where, I, like, I can't hold it in. And I suppose it's like everyone has their own kind of 
image of of what it looks like does the grief lessen or do we learn to carry it like do we expand around it and become big enough but then there are those moments where it just comes in really acutely yeah Um, that's interesting actually because i find that quite isolating in itself like for many reasons but with cancer so much drama and tv and things that you relax to are about life going on as normal you know this leads to this leads to this drama uh, or cancer's being used for its drama, you know, mm-hmm. oh, she's got cancer. And I feel like I just pick up books and go, this means nothing to me. This means nothing to me. And not not with everything, but it is interesting, even that, like when you relax and the stories that we tell each other, you're not included in those stories. And I think as a woman of a certain age, like I'm a woman in my 40s without a child, that's hugely isolating. I have had cancer. I can't do a sort of big woohoo job. And, you know, I'm not that career woman who didn't have the kids. And I think, yeah, that you're like, where's my where's my story? I can't see that. And it's interesting. I quite often like I like listening to the Shine podcast, but I also find myself um, listening to a lot of disability podcasts because I do think I now have like absolutely chronic anxiety and fatigue and the menopausal symptoms. Um, and I think it's because it's about being excluded, you know. So obviously that's not as severe as say, um, you know, not being able to use it, being paraplegic or something. But the stories they tell really chime with me. And I never would have thought that. Like, I'm listening to all these disability podcasts and it's just like, yes, oh, yes, that makes sense. Yes, that, yes, that's me. And that's really where I find a very comfortable home because it is suddenly about being not the mainstream, being excluded. You know, like I have a real bee in my bonnet about work. You know, so many people can't work because they're just a bit tired and the workplace is so brutal these days. You know, I was chatting to a friend of mine who works for CAB and he got me to check a job ad because... You know, I was like, sorry, it's slightly going off tangent, but it's like hit the ground running, go the extra mile, self-starter. And I just look at things like that and I'm like, well, I'm clever. I've got a degree. I've got an MA. I've got years of experience. I've been through cancer. I have loads of stuff to give you, but that scares me. I'm not going to apply for that job. I mean, I'm exhausted just hearing about that advert. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think people just put on pace, but it's so chronic how one little thing like fatigue just excludes you yeah. from so much and, and add to that, you know, you can't fit into the sort of mother and baby group. You, you know, you haven't got these little markers or these groups in society. And I was 37. I was like, I'm young. And all my friends are so thoughtful, but they are busy with their kids and they are leading their lives and they are getting on with these groups. And, yeah. um, you know, they've been very and generous. In something about being on the outside of that, you know, like when everyone is, yeah, everyone else seems to have this this experience of this whole world, this whole life that like for me, I don't have any access to. But um, before we um, wrap up today, I would love to hear from each of you one thing that you could if you could go back in time and just whisper a piece of advice to yourself um kind of at the beginning of this you know the beginning of where the loss was for you what might you tell yourself so it could be advice it could be reassurance could be anything and if we could start with Gemma that would be great um I think I would just say that like it does get better first of all like I know it's really cliche sort of thing to say but I think time is a healer um I think going back to what I don't know if it was you Tatum that was saying you know about the aloneness and when I first got diagnosed and I went through this fertility thing I felt very very alone Um, I thought about all my friends and how they would all start having children and I would be so left out. And I try to have like a lot of grace with people as well because ultimately this experience is my subjective individual experience. So nobody can really go through it and feel it in the same way that I am. So I can't really expect them to sort of understand. But through connection and through meeting people much like yourselves who Yes, your experiences and your stories are different, but I think the pain is the the same in many, many ways. And I can relate with something each of you have individually said. I think I would have reached out and connected like a lot earlier um, because it's healed me like so much. And I think, yeah, if I could say something to myself going back, I would have been like, don't suffer. Like, you, you know, you don't have to be like this big existentialist like suffering alone do you know what i mean like go out there speak to people reach out and 
I don't really have anything to build on that. Is that I right? love <laughs> that. I, it's so powerful. It really is in, in that lonely place to um, then be able to, you know, talk to other people that also understand that lonely place. There was such power in that. Um, and I'm really, really glad um, that, you know, you're finding that Gemma um, and uh, that it's been it's been useful to chat to other people kind of in, in similar ish experiences. Um, Katie, what what would you if you could whisper something to yourself? I think for me, what I want to say is that there's um, actually no one piece of advice. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is that's because why other people get it wrong. We've already said that people can sort of get to the stage where they say things because they want to make things better. So mm. for me, I don't think there's ever one piece of advice. I think it's about how we learn to cope with adjustments. Yeah. Um, so we're going through um, another change again at the moment, and it's around me getting out the house more. And actually, my husband's struggling with that because there's actually a change in our relationship and there's a change in our day-to-day -day lives. And there's, and I think it's about generally how we cope with those adjustments, um, whether that's as individuals or um, as a couple, or if you see my husband and I as a family, or I'm sure there's plenty of listeners who have had children and then had a diagnosis, which is, means that they don't have any further children um, we're all talking it from a perspective of not having any children. I know a lot of our listeners are not in that situation. Yeah, secondary um, and, infertility can be just as just as hard. Yeah, and I think it's about how um, how we all choose to cope with adjustments um, as individuals, as couples, as families, um, and within what support networks that we have. Thank you, Katie, for sharing that. And Amanda, do you have anything of any kind? It could be advice, it could be a joke, it could be anything that you'd like to whisper back to yourself. It could be my a... Top yeah, my top tip is don't get cancer, but that one is... Uh, is quite <laughs> no, I definitely am still in a process of acceptance. I, I, I hear all the time about people going, I'm actually glad I got cancer and I'm, you know, it's changed me. And I, I find that hard because I see how much pain it's brought to the people yeah. I love the most in the world. And, and But I do realise that in order to move forward, that that is important. And so I guess um, it would just be, be be kind to yourself, you know, like how upset I got about making those decisions. There are no right decisions. None of this is easy. And like you said, you know, some people have kids and find it really hard and wish they hadn't. You know, we all have to walk through certain doors and it means closing off other doors and you know you could have three kids and just grieve for actually your independence and everything that life gave you or you cannot have kids and you're grieving for the family that you never had and um you know it's just give yourself time you know i still am sort of thinking it's five years down the line why am i not better but i think what something really pertinent you said earlier where you're just saying it's so much to take on in a week and i think that's why cancer is quite unique because then the fallout just rolls on yeah. and on and on because actually not having children was something that maybe i would have dealt with within five six ten years slowly and you were given two days and so then you have to give yourself the time afterwards and i think the same you know not having kids at 40 45 50 55 is very different and you will be grieving all those different things at different stages. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's just something that you you have to process. And I always, I don't always do it, but yeah, my tip is just just be kind to yourself and give yourself. I'm loving, yourself. loving all of these. So we've got kind of connection. There's no one bit of advice, you know, and that it's a little bit about figuring out how to roll with adjustments and then being compassionate. I think that those are amazing takeaways. Thank you so much, all of you, for chatting with me today. And thank you so much to Radio Facilities for being our awesome sponsors. And thanks to all of you for listening. Till next time, bye. Not your grandma's cancer show.